All right. <laughs> Here we go. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, we're getting to, to get a little trickle of attendees to our uh, ASO at Home series. My name is Darko Buteritz. I'm the music director and conductor of our Asheville Symphony. Broadcasting here from Tallahassee. I'm here for a little recording project we're doing at the end of the week. Um, uh, welcome today's uh, guests. We have musicians from the Asheville Symphony under 40. So it's ASO under 40. And uh, we're going to explore different topics tonight. And we're very happy that uh, you're here with us. A um, couple of housekeeping things. Uh, we always welcome questions from you, our audience. We can't see you. We can't hear you. You can see us. Uh, so if on your Zoom screen, if you um, move your mouse, you'll see buttons at the bottom of the screen. There is a Q&A button. Feel free to ask any questions that may come up uh, as we go along, and we'll try to get an answer to all of those. Um, so that's a better way to, to get in touch right, as opposed to the chat. And then for my participants, as I said, this is very informal. We're having an informal conversation, so don't feel like I'm interviewing you. Let it, let's have it flow back and forth and uh, we'll just kind of see where we end up. But um, again, welcome to everybody who is joining us tonight. Uh, grab your favorite drink. In my case, it's a very boring cup of tea uh, today. Uh, nothing special, just like herbal. Um, there was enough coffee had before. The Augusta Nationals mug? Yes, my yeah. hosts here in Tallahassee are, are huge golf fans. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my extent of golf is like trying to hit the ball and failing miserably. <laughs> so definitely not my mug. That's just, yeah, yeah, we're not. I grew up in Augusta. That's my. Experience. Ah, that's how you know it. Yeah. Okay. Well, Paul, since you spoke up, break the ice. Uh, tell us a little about yourself and then we'll go around and, and introduce okay. our, our panel okay. this evening. Tell us where you're from, your name, uh, what you play, etc. Yep. Uh, originally from Augusta, Georgia. I came to Asheville in 15 years ago uh, to go to UNCA and started crafting a um, little music career uh, in the community. Uh, I'm in the second violin section of Asheville Symphony since 2009. Um, this past season was my first as stage manager. Uh, I teach private violin at, through Asheville Music School, now sort of at home, but, and play string quartets uh, in weddings and gigs like that. Wonderful. Welcome. Thank you. Who's next? I guess I'll speak up. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Rachel Igo. Um, I'm in the first violin section of the Asheville Symphony. Um, I have been since 2007 with a few little um, breaks here and there, um, moving away to get married, have moved back to Asheville, have moved away <laughs> several times. Um, always seem to find my way back here. Um, and let's see, um, I'm originally from this area, not too far from here. Um, and I live in Morganton. So. Welcome, great to have you. Anya, would you like to go next? Or? Sure. My name is Anastasia Yarbrough. Many folks know me as Anya. I play viola with Asheville Symphony. I'm originally from Memphis, Tennessee. I moved here, not from Memphis, but from Rhode Island in 2011. I was working at a nonprofit called Green Opportunities and doing work in the community around matters of community development, um, outreach with, the, with local Black Asheville and some environmental justice work. And I got back into music after a very long hiatus of doing mostly environmental and animal work. Uh, I did that in, I got back into music in 2017. So I've been active with Asheville Symphony since then. And well, your, your chops are remarkably good considering that you, you haven't played in a while. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That, that's not a given. That, that's it's hard thing to bring your playing shape back. That's wonderful. Yeah, uh, we Thank appreciate you. you. I'm very glad to have you in the in the viola section. So, Keila, welcome. Thank you for having me. 
I'm Keila Walton. I'm originally from Texas. I'm a harpist. We're from Texas. <laughs> Texas is a, a large republic. <laughs> yes, I grew up in the Dallas-Fort Worth area in Arlington, Texas, okay. Okay. and um, did my degrees in Austin at UT and then in Houston. Um, and I have, I'm relatively new to the Carolinas. I am currently living in Spartanburg, South Carolina, and I've been here for just a little over two years. My first concert with the Asheville Symphony was actually the Warren Haynes concert in January of 2019. So I'm relatively oh. new to the scene. Um, that, that's a way to introduce yourself to the orchestra, <laughs> right? something a little different. Yeah. Very, very different, but lots of fun. Um, not a new thing for me uh, before moving to the Carolinas, uh, we lived in Buffalo, New York, and I did a one year interim position with the Buffalo Philharmonic and did a whole bunch cool. of all kinds of different concerts with that orchestra, so including rock shows and pop shows and things like that. But Warren Haynes was a pretty special introduction to Asheville for sure. So, yeah, I know that, um, that, was, that was very memorable. Sorry, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, no, and uh, so I play weddings and gigs and I teach, I'm a Suzuki teacher and very happy to be here this evening. Wonderful. Well, as you, as you know, this is Musicians Under 40. Now, it was supposed to be moderated by somebody actually under 40, but you know, uh, we had some scheduling issues, so forgive me, I'm slightly over the hump. But uh, one thing I, I thought we'd start with in, in this discussion, and there's many things to cover, and you know, um, but uh, for me, I feel we're born in a very special time because of the change of society going from being an analog society going to being a digital society and everything both positive and negative that that has done to our world. And one thing that I thought of, I mean, Paul mentioned earlier before the call and also Kila, actually you have your teaching setup behind you, right? Is, is that correct? You can <laughs> see in the, in the background, the, the modern 2020 studio for teaching these days. <laughs> I want to ask each of you, um, what are some things that you do to grow yourself as a musician that your teachers never had access to, or maybe still would not even, would not cross their mind, especially from a technological angle? So let's start, we'll, we'll start, we'll go the, the other way around. Let's start at the top of the, top of the screen with Kila and, and uh, see where we come up with and just have a little discussion on that. Because it really is, the, the world has changed entirely for us. Well, one of the things that I think is amazing now is just the incredible access everyone has. So, you know, the generation previously, if you wanted to study a recording to prepare for a concert, you had to physically go buy a recording or go physically be in a library. And now it's on your phone. You know, you can get on Spotify and hear any orchestra in the world play, you know, with any conductor, you know, 17 different versions of Symphony Fantastique. It's right there in your pocket. Um, so let's say, did you play Fantastique with us last, last yes. season? Mm -hmm. You did, yeah. Mm -hmm. So what was that like? I mean, what, what's the process like? Do you, uh, I should uh, give a little context. Symphony Fantastique by Berlioz, actually like the first great symphonic work that features harp big mm -hmm. time. The entire mm -hmm. second movement is uh, a really special moment. The scene of the ball uh, exemplified by, I guess it could be multiple harps, but two harp parts. Mm -hmm. And um, so, how would you approach that? Would you listen to all these different recordings one by one looking for different interpretations or what's your, what's, what's your mind thinking when you're, when you're listening and preparing for something like that? Uh, yes, when you're listening, you know, you're listening for all the very possible different tempos. So you're prepared for whatever interpretation this orchestra is going to take. There's not going to be a surprise. <laughs> right. Yes. And, and, you know, you're, you're listening for, um, just the clarity and and also for for me when I prepare for orchestra work it's so that I know how my part fits in the context of everything else you know mm -hmm. so I am so ready to play what I need to play that I am not surprised by what's going on around me and, and so I listen to recordings I also look at the score um, because you never know in different stages what you're going to hear. You know, what's really clear on a recording that can help you jump into where you need to play, you may not hear very well on stage. You know, you may not be able to hear the bassoon part because you may be 30 feet away with you know, everybody else in between you. So, um, yeah, I, I'm listening for all kinds of context clues to help me be prepared. Right. 
<laughs> so we've had uh, two sessions so far. We had principles two weeks ago. Last week was the string section. We haven't had, Kiel, you're our first harp player. And so my question for you, and this is, again, this is a free-flowing conversation, so we're going to go kind of all over the place. But my question for you is, when I was taught, you know, in school, uh, percussion players and harp players were kind of the things, were instruments that you would approach with the sensitivities like once it starts the head is down it's like autopilot it's really hard to do like rubato with harp or marimba or piano to a degree because there's a lot of things going on you're working with pedals the feet are controlling what uh, what key you're playing in there, there's a lot of things going on How, is that kind of part of the equation when you're when you're preparing um, in a way to be prepared for any minefield that, you know, somebody on the podium might be like, ooh, surprise. Right, right. right. You're, you're, because harps and um, pianists and percussionists, and certainly on the mallet instruments, play more than one note at a time, um, it's very difficult to think your way fast enough through music. So a lot of what I do is uh, muscle memory and actually memorizing the music so that the, the other issue that harpist faces, there's a plane of strings I'm looking at, then there's a music on a stand, and then there's a conductor up here. Well, nobody can look three places at once. So something has to go. And generally you need to see what you're doing and you need to look at the conductor. So the music is the first thing to get thrown out of uh -huh. the equation of what you look at. Um, other challenges as a harpist in the orchestra are um, the attack of the sound. So string players, can sort of sneak in and there's some safety in numbers there because there's usually more than one of you and <laughs> <laughs> it's very rare to have two harps um, wind players can sneak in with their sound you know and sort of start softly and then oh yeah this is where we actually meant to start playing this note with the harp or with a mallet that's the note it's there and it's either early or late or right there with everyone else and so that's another challenge yeah. as a harpist in an orchestra for sure who wants to go next? Uh, Anya, uh, what's your take on, on this whole uh, business of technology and music? Do you use it in, in your preparation as a musician or has it been of help? It's, it's an interesting question because I don't know that I think about it that much because of my age. It's been part of my life for at least 20 years. And so I don't even really think about it. I just think about it as a tool that's been part of my life. Um, in terms of how I use it in teaching, it's very minimal. I, I use Zoom and I use Skype on, to meet online, but otherwise- Have you already done this before the tools. pandemic? Um, no, not before the pandemic, but now it, it's been since the pandemic, but I am kind of liking it. I might stick with this for a while uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's 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 actually there's some perks to teaching online and that's teaching strings and voice like ccm voice oh you teach voice as well i do i do cool yeah so that's that's actually it's been uh pretty successful i do use some apps with uh, many of my my students are beginners to music. So when I'm teaching them ear training and basic theory, just basic reading notation, I use some apps to help them with that. And, and that's something that did not exist. Like Do you have 10, some favorites? 15 like? years ago. Um, I like the Pano chromatic tuner because it's, it's pretty universal. It, it can work well with voice and it can also work well with violin. And so I use it. I use it to help my my kids on violins tune themselves and just and to hear pitches. And I also use it to help my voice students to match pitches successfully. Yeah, no, the I remember as a kid first getting a, a string instrument tossed in my hands, like you know, in middle school or whatever, and you know, it came with, with those taped frets on yeah. it. And you know, if you, the, the, the nature of, of a flexible pitch instrument like a string instrument is that there is not such thing as one note. Mm -hmm. And it really was limiting in terms of the approach of the ear, like what the ear would hear as like, if you were singing in your head, that tape doesn't match. 
right? I mean, it, in the context of the, of the pitch is determined by, or sorry, the, the pitch of the note is determined by the context that it finds itself in. And uh, it really, you know, I look at now some of the, I think I have like, a, uh, I have another tuner app, I forget what it's called. What's the one that lights up green, guys? It has a happy face, the happy Tonal face energy. tuner. <laughs> Tonal energy. <laughs> and I was just, I was blown away. It's like, my God, I wish I had this. Because you can set actually different, um, um, different, different types of intonation. You can do uh, equal temperament. You can do just intonation. It's, it's really, really cool. I'm like, wow, this is kind of neat. And also, I'm struck by the fact that we have technology now that can tune voice, which is really, I mean, it, it's quite tricky to, for the microphone to pick it up. And it's just, it's like, wow, amazing. So I, I think for students nowadays, there is really a blessing in terms of that technical preparation that there is, there is a feedback loop that you didn't have before in the practice room necessarily, other than plucking in the piano and then trying to kind of find, find references. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Rachel, on, on this subject? Do, do, you, do you teach as well? Do you, do you teach violin? I do. Yeah. And um, what are your experiences? Um, so I actually have used Zoom and Skype pre-pandemic to teach, not often, but, you know, certain, um, you know, like if somebody gets sick or, you know, that, that kind of thing. So, um, but I mean, I guess the, the thing for me that's just amazing is like Keila was saying, um, you know, like when I was in college, I went to the Cleveland Institute and they had this incredible library of scores and CDs and all that kind of stuff. And actually my teacher had, um, a loaning library in his studio that he would wow. loan out, you know, all this. I mean, it was just really, really cool. And now it's, it's almost like that's become obsolete in a way, you know? Right. Exactly. I mean, it's crazy to me that I can write off my Apple music subscription as a tax deduction, you know, that, I mean, it's, it's just wild to me that all of that is on your Speaking phone. Speaking like a true freelance musician. Well, right. that, that's, yes. <laughs> Yes, I agree. This, this idea that now in this technological age, you are responsible, you know, for like the entire spectrum of um, the business of being a freelance musician. You are your own booking agent, you're your, you know, your tax accountant, and all of these different things, which, I mean, you know, I don't really think that that has it wasn't expected of musicians, you know, until very it, recently. It's to true. Do all of those things. Did, did you have, did you have any, when you were, I, I opened this up to everybody. Did you have any courses in your education at conservatory at the university relating to business as a musician? Was that ever part of the equation for anybody? No, no. but now it is, you know, and I, I think, it's, but it's changed. Yeah, so it has. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think yeah. that, um, let's see, cause I left CIM in 2007. So, I mean, even 13 years ago, it's amazing the things that have changed where, you know, like that, that is like probably one of the first classes that you will take at a conservatory or, you know, in any music program, because it's so important. And people don't know, like I was talking to somebody a couple of weeks ago um, and she was like, will you help me write my vitae? And I'm like, how do you not know how to do that? You know, you know what I mean? It's just simple things like that, that, you know, like 15 years ago, I had to Google, <laughs> you know, or like, right. you know, have somebody it, it's just crazy how everything has changed now you can use resume genius and like just plug in all of your stuff and it just pre-populates everything it's wild to me <laughs> and also completely unfair but um you know it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's wild well and i would say you know in terms of education to piggyback onto that gone uh -huh. are the days where musicians just auditioned for an orchestra and that was all you had to do was show up to an orchestra and do your job there and you were done yeah. You know, there's very few jobs like that anymore. Now you have to, you know, like you say, be your own booking agent. And then when you do have a job with an orchestra, you have to advocate for that orchestra. You have to be involved in the community now. Mm -hmm. um, and these are great things. I, th I think it's a wonderful trajectory that we're on in, along those lines. Mm -hmm. But it, yeah, it's very different than just- It's a different skill set and, entirely. Yeah, yeah. yeah, just go to school and be a we, good musician. Each of us has become in a way, willingly or not, we're ambassadors for the art form. I think it's also exactly. product probably of, of the fact that we, the world produces more, let's say, entertainment options than ever before. I mean, uh, when you hear the fact that, you know, uh, their NFL or NBA has a difficult time filling certain arenas, 
you know, how does classical music even compete with, with something like that? You know, and, and really it has, I, I find actually great uh, pride and also fortune in working in relatively smaller communities. I mean, Asheville is not a small town. We, we got a great orchestra, we do great things, but you know, it's not New York, it's not Chicago. And the connection we have with our audience feels very, very intimate. It, they're really one-on-one -on -one relationships. Mm -hmm. And I know for some of you, you know, you, you had maybe not in Nashville, but in other orchestras, you always, you know, you find ways to, to maybe meet a patron and meet somebody. And it kind of, it creates a feeling of, of community. And I think that's kind of ultimately what the purpose of, of an arts organization is these days, is to really foster that. Um, Paul, what are, what are your thoughts? Uh, not necessarily related to teaching, just in terms of technology and music. How, yeah. the, what do you see things change and like, what are your thoughts? In orchestras in general, yeah, a couple things. Um, I am SLP. I am SLP. Let's tell everybody what this is, what, what this is for, for our non-musician friends. International Music Score Library Project. Oh, you actually know the acronym. I never. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I used <laughs> to call it Petrucci. It was, it was Petrucci at one point, and it's like, That's yeah, the only very way good. I could uh, keep the order correctly. Is it like, I am LS? No, that's because it, yeah. I had to learn. Score learn library learn project. Order, order right. Um, yeah, that's a so this online is, database of where anyone can upload um, public domain, therefore free, Sheet and music. sometimes even not and on the board. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, you know, one, I... of the, one of the costs we don't talk about uh, oftentimes in public is what it, you know, people know that, you know, to put on a concert, a big part of that is the hall or the musicians or the production lights, etc. But the actual music, the physical music we have on the stands can get quite expensive and can get quite difficult to obtain. And uh, 20 years ago, you basically had two major reprint publishers, meaning people who reprinted um, music that was out of the public domain. That was Calmus and Lux. And Calmus closed their offices last year. I don't think they even, they're not physical anymore. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these were basically places you could get printed music for cheap. And nowadays, almost everything is available online. And oftentimes you'll find, that this is for me, when, when I do some of my, my, I have to get some tricks uh, regarding publishing. If you can't find a piece which is in public domain in the US, sometimes it's in public domain in Europe or in Canada. And then a VPN system is actually quite useful to be able to download those scores and to be able to, to work with them. Um, and it's also been very helpful in last minute crisis situations when somebody forgets their part and you can put an iPad on their, on their stand, it's like, Here's a part of the piece, last minute, download it, go. Um, so yeah, uh, certainly has, I, I know for my colleagues in, in other countries where they don't have big budgets for libraries or they don't have access even to publishers, IMSLP has been a complete game changer. It's just a giant library of, of orchestral parts and music and also solo music, correct? I mean, you can get pretty much anything in the public domain, which is, you know, to play an instrument is, is quite expensive and growing up, you know, to have access to sheet music that's so readily, readily, readily available must be, must be incredible. Yeah, I mean, it, that, that would have been a dream for me growing up if I heard something on the radio or in a concert that, that I'd never heard before and was blown away by it, as is often the case. You get, and like, wow, I would really like to see what that looks like on paper and then like spend an afternoon working through it. And, and now you can do that just hear something, catch the, catch the name of it and look it up like most other things, I guess. Right. One, yeah. I, I'll share one, one personal story on, on my end uh, that's completely different is, I love YouTube. I, I, I get the YouTube premium subscription without the ads. And one, for any piece, especially pieces that maybe are less known, I love finding performances, but not with great orchestras. <laughs> I love funding performances of like youth orchestras, college orchestras, where kind of the notes are there, but you know, there's not a seasoned ensemble that will basically polish everything up no matter what. And 
what I discover is it's a great resource to figure out what things go wrong all the time. Every piece, as you know, like every piece we play in orchestra has the spot that every orchestra has difficulty with. And it just simply has to be rehearsed. There's like one or two bars. And for me, that's been kind of a, an interesting thing as a way to say, okay, don't do this. This doesn't work. Do something else. Find a different solution. And, uh, you know, unlike my colleagues here, I don't have the opportunity to test things out prior to the first rehearsal. It's like, it's all imagination. And so to see somebody else do it wrong is a validation not to go down that path. <laughs> Uh, do, do any of you, can you do the, the reverse on the, on the instrumental side? Are you able to like, do you ever listen to some performances? You're like, no, I don't, I, I can't stand this, but it's good for me because I know what not to do. Has that ever been the case? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and with my students, you know, they, they go to YouTube all the time to find recordings of things. And a lot of times you'll find pieces that are perhaps written in three, four, and someone's performing it with four beats in a measure instead of three, <laughs> you know? You'll find things that are really inaccurate because anybody and everybody can upload things. So one of the things we work on is, okay, go and listen to more than one performance. And let's talk about, you know, and look at it with your music. And, you know, let's talk about what was great. What did you like? You know, wh where did this person struggle that you struggle in the piece? You know, like all, all of these things, you know, let, let's, let's develop some critical thinking here rather than just taking YouTube's word for it, that that's how it goes. Right. I, I noticed that in um, uh, some sort of instructions from the youth orchestra, some of my students that are in the Asheville Symphony Youth Orchestra, uh -huh. the, the conductor specifically said, you know, look up several recordings or versions on YouTube or wherever else, because don't just go with one, <laughs> get several. I was like, oh yeah, that's good point. That sound advice. Yeah, yeah no, it, it's it really, it's a, it, it, it's a great resource if you're able to use it correctly, right? Filter. That's, that's where it comes. You have to have a filter. Okay, well, on, on, a, on a similar slash different note, you know, given that your stewards, you know, of, orchestra as an institution, world has changed, society has changed. Where do you see the orchestra in 20 years? Not the actual symphony, the institution of the orchestra in 20 years. Does it exist? What is it like? Has it changed? What's its purpose? Who wants to go? Um, the thing that I have found super exciting over the last six months is that um, things seem to be, there, there's a huge emphasis on like breaking down that barrier between um, the people that are on stage and the audience. Um, and I think that that's super important because for a long time in classical music, it's almost, it's almost felt like an us and them kind of thing. Um, and, you know, classical music is not necessarily accessible to everyone. That's not the case in Asheville. And it just like warms my heart <laughs> every time we play a concert that, you know, uh, if I'm sitting on the outside of the stage in the first violin section, I'll see, you know, like people like with their furs and their pearls and, you know, their, their stoles and all this kind of stuff. And then I'll see like people that are just having a good time. They've probably had like five beers and they're going to have a couple more. And it's just like this amazing thing. And, and they, you know, they clap when they're not supposed to. And it's, you know, they don't know the rules. And that's so like, it's refreshing, you know, because they don't know that there is this um, etiquette that's expected of them. Well, we should say very little music that we play in the hall was written with that etiquette as expected. That's very true. And th I, this is something I want to point out to the audience because, you know, we are products of, of our, uh, ra you know, ra being raised musically, being raised in a concert hall, whatever. The whole idea of concert being a lights down religious experience comes with Wagner. Mm -hmm. Actually, not even Wagner himself, but people who followed, who were disciples of Wagner. Mm -hmm. So Mahler is the, the first man to close the doors, you know, at 700, the opera is starting, lights are down, shut up, pay attention to the overture this is great music and it deserves full attention because what happened before people were 
talking, they were drinking, they were eating. Um, you know, it was the principal evening entertainment in an in a urban environment. And so that's when it came up. And you think the music we play, the music we play oftentimes is much older than that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the function of music really varies where it was written. Sometimes it was written for, for uh, really like a family outing, you know, a royal home, their chamber music party or their orchestra performed, or it was for a church service in town, or it was, you know, it was an outdoor uh, concert that was supposed to take place. The, the environment's always different, yet we're always fitting them in this, let's say, early 20th century, late 19th century model. And um, I do find it, um, while there is a, a beauty to tradition, tradition also evolves. And so, as you say, you know, the, we have people who applaud between movements, and in some ways, they are more authentic to the music we're playing than people who know they're not supposed to applaud during the movement. Um, the idea of not applauding between movements is the idea that, you know, composer composes a symphony. There's four movements, three, three opportunities to clap in between, right? But no, we're supposed to hear the first movement and hold it in and then listen to the second because it somehow metaphysically connects to the first. But that's not always the case. Mm -hmm. Beethoven had encored his movements and was disappointed if, you know, people didn't applaud after a movement. So, yeah, the, that applause is a small thing, but you, you bring up the bigger point, which is the concert hall itself, the, the people who are coming to the concert hall is changing, and that is a good thing. We should be reflective of the society um, that is our town. I feel sometimes that we could be more like Asheville on the streets as Asheville in the hall. That's just my personal opinion, but you know, um, ultimately the organization is welcoming and, and uh, certainly from, from the organizational side, there is, the doors are open to everybody. I just, um, I, I think it's also been interesting to see how um, some organizations have scrambled to meet the challenge of COVID and mm -hmm. others have, you know, I mean like one of the first things that the Asheville Symphony did was the Ashokan Farewell Project. And I forget what else was on um, that project because I didn't play it, but- um, But that was it. it was, okay. Yeah, the right. Ashokan Farewell, yeah. Um, and, and, you know, like even now, six and a half months later, there are some orchestras that are just scrambling to do a virtual project. And so I, I think that that just goes to show, um, you know, how innovative some orchestras are really trying to be to, you know, stay connected to their community and their patrons. Um, well, a case in point, you know, we, uh, again, what, what are we now? This is the first week of October. This might be our second concert already of the season. Yeah. And I made a point, you know, when we started this is like, you know, this would be our season, but this is actually what our season is today are these conversations that because we do want to build a relationship. We want to break the wall between the performers and the audience. And we want our audience to get to know you because ultimately, Yes, conductor gets all the glory because they're on the podium and, you know, everything else, but I don't make a single sound on that stage. Maybe I influence, I can screw everybody up, but, you know, like, ultimately, you make all the sounds that happen on stage. You're the true stars of the show, and, and so you need to be known. I'm, I'm really happy that, that we're doing these conversations, and um, we'll, we'll have a chance. Any other ideas on, on what, kind of the orchestra of the future, 20 years from now, 20, 2040? Well, what does it look like? Any thoughts? I know what's happening right now, and it's not just orchestras, but opera houses as well, mm -hmm. are responding. They're responding to the protests. They're responding to Black Lives Matter and mm -hmm. are intentionally looking at how they are complicit in the maintenance of white supremacy. And like, evaluating their programming like do we always have to program dead white guys the same composers over and over and over and over again maybe let's look into not only programming artists composers of color today but composers of color of the past who were shut out of classical music because of white supremacy. So there, there's, a, there's conversations happening about that. I'm seeing pieces moving. I'm seeing like, hey, let's, let's play Florence Price and, and a host of other black composers. And so that might be a thing. I assume that it'll be a trend just like anything else in the United States, but it'd be nice to see it actually 
emerge into something meaningful to to who we are as a people well it, credit I, go ahead to, well a couple things uh, i went to um the um was it league of american orchestras conference mm -hmm. two or three summers ago uh mm -hmm. in chicago and yo-yo ba um was the closing speaker and and performed with chicago symphony um and he he said the the days of like perfect notes and you know all that the what we think of as traditional classical and symphonic music are gone like perfect notes don't cut it anymore if they ever did um that you have to say something and with your music and darko reflects that that's a, a big thing that i've learned from you darko since you've come here is to you know like take care of every note and say something with every every phrase um and, and reflect your community and they did he did a a piece that was like commissioned and inspired by uh, um combating chicago's gun violence mm -hmm. uh to close all that and to Asheville symphony's credit i remember the opening concert last season was nearly all brown composers with the exception of Ravel and Bolero, but it, and it wasn't greatly intended. It somewhat fell on deaf ears. Um, but it was maybe a little bit ahead of its time or too bold. I don't think so. I, I just think, you know, uh, I appreciate sometimes it. I like to mix things up in programming. I'm, I'm a fan of, yep. I'm of the opinion that we have the great opportunity to have 300 years plus of great music. Right. And to do the same things every single time does get a little old and I do try to mix things up. Where, you know, the challenges for the orchestra, or orchestra are like, we're like turtles. Um, <laughs> in, it really is. The, the financial model, the economic model of the orchestra is very, very challenging. Um, okay, so what? <laughs> Ultimately. Uh, to come back, it's so what? You, you, you have to change, you have to reflect of what the society is, you have to reflect of the needs of that society and what the society needs to hear at the given moment. And uh, right now we're in a, in a position where uh, issues are being brought up that have been uh, suppressed for decades, ever. And uh, I find it exciting. I find it exciting to discover new repertoire. I have discovered some incredible composers in the last two years that I never would have discovered if it wasn't for this. Um, here in Tallahassee, there was a really cool project with Joel Thompson, who was a composer uh, based in New Haven currently. It was a piece called The Seven Last Words of the Unarmed. Very disturbing work for a uh, male chorus and orchestra that takes inspiration from The Seven Last Words of Christ, which was, you know, of course, Haydn uh, had the big setting with the string quartet, but basically it was the last words of seven African-Americans who were killed by authority figures um, around the country. And it was the setting of their text. And, you know, Tallahassee has serious issues in terms of race and its history. Um, mm -hmm. And it was a very delicate project to bring to this community. But what I loved about it, and what I think is a really great recipe going forward, is that it wasn't presented as, oh, we're just playing this piece because we want to do something different. But the piece was actually taken as a way to bring conversation. And that's how it was framed. It wasn't framed as an orchestral concert. It was framed as we're performing this piece and we're bringing different organizations around town from different perspectives and different viewpoints. So, uh, of course, the big part of the African-American community was involved, but we also brought like the sheriff's department and the police force from FSU, and they came together and a community conversation was held, held among 1,200 people who attended. In fact, the event, the piece itself is maybe 25 minutes and it was followed by about a half an hour, 40 minute discussion between panelists discussing race issues and police violence in our community here. I was like, this is like the best thing an orchestra can possibly do. But it took enormous work prior to any note being played to be able to bring all the different groups around town to come together, 
meaningfully, willingly, with attitude of let's move this thing forward and use the art as a catalyst to bring the conversation forward. And it worked beautifully. Um, but, you know, that's just, ultimately, it's still just one piece in my entire time here as music director. So, you know, I think there are, there are models uh, that exist that, that can be powerful. And, um, you know, I, I think um, when framed with conversation, it's a, it's a really, a, it was a great recipe here that worked here in this community. Um, one other thing, of course, along uh, with this, we've had lots of conversations the last two years about female composers. And um, I've, you know, I think uh, the piece we played last year, we played the Anna Klein Masquerade in October along uh, with, with the Symphony Fantastique. And I think that was the first female composer Asheville Symphony has played in a few years. It's, it, and it's, you know, it's a trend that, that needs to continue. Um, so anyway, having said that, there's challenges ahead, but I, I'm very glad to see in, in our field, there are conversations being had and it's a, there's an awareness being formed that will shape programming countrywide, nationwide, uh, for years to come. Erica, if I may. Yes. What you you mentioned about the project in Tallahassee it, and the how the coordinating and bringing the groups for and facilitating conversation, how that went down, it reminds mm -hmm. me of theater. It mm -hmm. reminds me of theater, and maybe what you're envisioning, at least in that instance, for the orchestra might be a path that theater has already undergone, in part because of the way theater is, it's, it doesn't cost as much to put on, at least it doesn't have to cost as much. That's, depends, that's a better way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't have to cost as much. And yeah. it's, it's been, it's had like a heavy involvement of diverse communities uh, people of color, the LGBTQ community, indigenous communities. It's, it's been a real uh, contribution to theater for a long time that we haven't had in classical music in part because of the, the, um, the, the intentional exclusion, right? So maybe this might be a wake up call for orchestras to learn from our sister performing arts and learn and how they how they engage activist topics, how they engage um, matters of the heart that that concern people's lives, and that that ultimately concern that help us to imagine a better future. Maybe maybe we should should learn from theater a bit more. I think Beyond we should that, learn from. I wouldn't know uh, how to do that because I haven't really done the administrative work of making an orchestra happen, but we're creative people. We can figure something out, right? Exactly. Uh, I, you know, one of the things I love about the Asheville Symphony and the aesthetic is that uh, I used to work before in orchestras where when any creative idea came up, it was like, basically, it's too expensive, done. Like, Anything you, you say can be shot down so easily. Any idea. Let's play music of the 16th century. Well, it's part of the historical performance uh, uh, purview. We really shouldn't touch it and we shouldn't expand our views towards repertoire. Done. You know, you're not going to use trombones. How can you have a concert without trombones, etc.? I mean, it's so easy to shoot down an idea. So what I love about the Asheville Symphony is that when ideas come up, we look at ways, how can we make this happen as opposed to there's just reasons we can't do it. Um, we did, actually, I, I'm very proud, you know, we, the Asheville Symphony did do a recording that's waiting to be released um, of George Walker's lyric uh, two weeks after uh, the shooting in Minneapolis. George Floyd, um, the, the lyric is, he, he was the first African-American composer to win a Pulitzer Prize in music, first pianist who performed with the uh, Philadelphia Orchestra and you know, like incredible musician, beautiful, um, George Walker, not George Floyd, George Walker is the name of the composer. Um, and it, you know, it was a really special experience. It was only nine musicians. Um, so that should be released soon. And I really look forward to that. 
uh, very soon. We have a couple of questions in the meantime. Um, all right, so thinking specifically about the Asheville Symphony audience we serve, what are things that make you love this particular organization? And what do you wish that your audience better understood about how we can best support your work? What do you love most about the Asheville Symphony? Paul, let's go to Paul, since he's muted. Oh. You already Gosh. answered the question, but you know, so, so everybody sees. Yeah, I would, I would live, love to reiterate what I wrote. Um, yeah, our woodwind section, uh, so many things that I love about, about Asheville Symphony, but it's hard to know where to start. One thing that comes to mind though is our woodwind section is awesome. They're so good individually and then, and together, which is not easy to do both of those things. And well, I put when I'm when I'm sitting fourth chair, second violin, I have the best seat in the house because I'm directly in front of them. Um, it's just great. They, they deserve even more credit than they get. I, I'm sure many people are aware, but not everyone. And they deserve even more credit. That's very kind of you. They're just great. Yeah. No, we, we have uh, and, and the youth orchestra is, is a really special program. It's amazing how much is, it's expanded. It was already great uh, 15 years ago but now it's really turned into something even bigger. And I, I went to a great fine arts middle and high school. Um, but outside of that had nothing like the youth orchestra uh, in my community. It's a, it's a really special pr program. I try to get my kids in there as soon as possible because they'll, I know they'll learn a ton. It's a great experience. I love it. I love it. I love it. Anybody else on that question? I'm not going to put Kilo on the spot. I know I only played a couple of concerts with the orchestra, but Rachel or um, Anya. I mean, just just the amazing community. <coughs> um, I mean, like I said, I've been playing with the symphony since 2007. Um, much of that time I've lived in or near Asheville. Um, some of those years I did not. And um, every single time I would come into town to play a concert, there was always somebody that was happy to put me up a board member. You know, and I mean, they would just like, it seemed like they were worshiping me for the time that I was staying there. I mean, they were just so lovely, such wonderful um, community support. And, um, you know, I've been on the performance side of organizations and I've also been on the administrative side of organizations. And that is not always the case. There's not, you know, that warm uh, community support in every organization. So that's just really wonderful. I think that's a, a Asheville special. Mm -hmm. it's, it speaks to the wonderful nature of our community. Well, one thing that there was one question that was asked earlier, which is <laughs> kind of a funny one. Do I pr prefer musicians over 40 or under 40 and why? And <laughs> I don't think I can answer that honestly <laughs> um, without getting in trouble, but I suppose I can, I'll generalize, and it's not necessarily with present company in, in any way. I, I think one of the, I can say in working with, let's say, I've had the opportunity to work with numerous college ensembles around the country. And one of the great things with college level musicians, young musicians, is that there is an energy that is brought that is really, really special. Um, and depending on the repertoire, it can be very, very effective because it creates just unbelievable power, drive, uh, excitement in the concert. There is a freshness because many of the younger people are playing a piece of work for the first time. Maybe they were waiting to play this work and never had the opportunity before. Um, and, you know, with an orchestra that's older and more established, um, performing, um, as we said, the canon of dead white guys over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, things become a little static. So two things happen. As a conductor, you have, it's a lot easier because the piece will go by itself. You almost don't have to do anything. But to mold it gets quite a bit more difficult. To change minds and to explore different ways of interpreting gets more difficult. However, uh, you also have musicians who bring great finesse and understanding which younger musicians, it really takes time to build um, orchestral playing skills in the orchestra. It's not something that, you know, 
when we study our instruments, we're studying how to play the instrument, not how to play in the orchestra. And, and playing in the orchestra is not something that can be really taken for granted. It really, there's many levels of, of uh, kind of things to, to grow on, to, to, to do on. So in, in that case, it's, um, it is nice to work with musicians who are more seasoned. I hope that answers your question. I don't know, that's neither here nor there. It's kind of a cop out, but because it is, I'm, I really don't find, uh, one way or the other. I see Kilo smiling. Were you going to add something? <laughs> no, I'm just saying it's very diplomatic because there's things to be learned from everyone in an orchestra, you know? Yes. Very diplomatic answer. <laughs> yes. Well, no, but sometimes, you know, uh, I, I will meet a young conductor and I will see the zeal in their eyes about the excitement of, of doing, let's say, like a, a Beethoven symphony for the first time. And, you know, I've had my share of Beethoven symphonies, thank God, you know, like it's been wonderful. I, I feel blessed by it, but I don't have the same excitement anymore like I did that very first time. And so to see that reminds you of that, you're like, oh yeah, it is actually special. I did a Beethoven Fifth Symphony here uh, in January uh, this year, and it was very strange to see before the first rehearsal, you know, in talking to a few musicians in the orchestra, like, yeah, Fifth of Beethoven again, you know, Beethoven Five, pa, 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 great, okay. And then somehow in rehearsal, everybody gets into it and you're like, oh yeah, this is why the Fifth Symphony is amazing. Yes, everybody's played it like 20, 30 times or more. And yet we all collectively love it. And it's like, there's just pieces like that that are, that are kind of eternal and, and powerful. I love it. Um, so speaking of repertoire, I always ask this, I ask this for every panel. Uh, what's a piece you've always wanted to play uh, and haven't had a chance to, to do yet in the Asheville Symphony. Like, what are some words? Uh, I'm going to pick up again. Go, Rachel. Mandarin. <laughs> miraculous Mandarin, I Bartok. I love Prokofiev. I love Prokofiev. Um, okay. And I have played the Miraculous Mandarin elsewhere, but not in the Asheville Symphony, so. Okay, okay. Okay. Um... Paul, what, what's your take? Um, well, I've only played Mahler two, and so more Mahler. More Maybe. Mahler. Wouldn't mind two again, but Anya is smiling. Others would be nice, and, uh, and Shostakovich. We've only done five and eleven, I think. The year yeah. nineteen oh five, the Bell. <laughs> it, I love it. You know, two weeks yeah. ago, Miraculous Mandarin came up. Last week was Shostakovich seven and Shostakovich ten. <laughs> All right, people. That, you know, just so you know, when you see it on a future season, you'll know why. All right. Anya, what about you? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't really, I haven't thought about it a lot. I mean, I could second that. I could, I could do Mahler. Um, yeah, any, you're a Mahler fan. Mahler, really. Quite a part, right. <laughs> yeah. I think... No, it's, it's difficult for me to think of an orchestral piece. So when the shutdown first happened, uh -huh. I took advantage of the Met streaming operas. Mm. <laughs> and I, I watched a ton of opera, more than I had in my life, in my entire life. And I was Ooh. thinking, yeah, I, I rarely get an opportunity to play opera. Some of these operas are really interesting, really interesting, like um, Nixon and China. That's wow. a really interesting opera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's different. Yeah. <laughs> that's different. Arco conduct opera yet? I bet that. I bet he's great at that. Uh, no, I don't. No, no, don't butter me up too much. <laughs> we were supposed to do this year. We were supposed to do Tosca in in November. In November, January, November. Yeah, November. We had a scheduled Tosca, basically a, a Tosca version with. A little bit reduced because it's a little too long for an orchestra concert. So like a two-hour Tosca with all the best arias and choruses and everything else. But, you know, the pandemic took it away. But, yeah, I would love, I love doing opera. It's one of my, my great loves and uh, something I, I enjoy very much. So let's, let's keep the, the conversation open. I, I, I like this. <laughs> I like this. I would agree uh, with all of these suggestions. They all sound yes. great to me. Um, I would add, you know, any ballet music. Um, ah. Anything with two harps, 
Uh, <laughs> so I could have or six and, harps, two harps at least, you know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so could be how, um, let, let me ask you, how do you feel about Wagner? This is a this, this is a very harp question. OK. <laughs> Um, well, you know, uh, the things to like about Wagner is that he understood that volume is an issue. And so everything he wrote is for more than one harp. Um, and so if you look at the ring cycle, it's actually scored for six harps. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, sometimes those six harps are divided with three and three playing the same parts in unison. Right. Uh, sometimes it's actually two, two, two. And so it's, the volume is really fun. Uh, and some of it is just almost impossible to actually execute. He, <laughs> he was of... not very friendly. I just remember no, that, no, like the, no. the, the writing is, I think we could do a whole Zoom chat on like <laughs> how composers have no clue what playing the harp is like. Pretty much. Because, yeah. I mean, seriously, <laughs> you look at it, if, if you look at, at, at harp music, it looks like piano music. You know, there's two staves, one in the treble, one in the bass. And composers who didn't know better basically wrote piano parts and said, go, do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, doesn't work that way. Doesn't work. And, you know, mm -hmm. every harp player I work with, like, basically is like rewriting music mm -hmm. to make the illusion of what the composer wanted and, you right. know, to basically get the harmony and, and as many notes as possible. But the, the, the parts are just are brutal. One of the well, things I want to do in coming seasons, sorry, please. No, just to illustrate that point, a, a piece everyone knows, Tchaikovsky's Nutcracker, right? The cadenza right. that you all hear, the waltz of the flowers. The waltz of the flowers. What you hear, ninety-nine point nine percent of harpist play is not what's on the page at all. Right. Oh. Exactly. Yeah. Because Tchaikovsky is just like something kind of like this. Go. <laughs> <laughs> Make it pretty. Make it pretty. Well, I do want to do. Uh, there's a wonderful um, um, arrangement edition. I don't know of Wagner's Ring, which I find to be a very long work. <laughs> Wagner's Ring is 16 hours long. It's an investment to, to sit down and see the whole thing. But there's a beautiful symphonic, uh, let's say a symphonic treatment of the music from the ring, which is so powerful and exciting. And it's done in chronological order, and it takes about 60 to 70 minutes to perform. So it's one concert, and it's all harp all the time. So like <laughs> one day, I hope we can do it, and I hope we can hire six harps so it can be... <laughs> Uh, that would be really a sight. I, I don't know if, if for our listeners how many have had an opportunity to see an orchestra with multiple harp sections. It is really thrilling uh, to do that. But unfortunately, budget is usually um, yes. what, what, what limits it. Uh, so, um, yeah, more, more harp. Always. I'm on board. It's not quite like more cowbell, but <laughs> yeah, we'll do more harp. Okay. Um, well, I just want to, I want to thank each and every one of you for, for joining us. I really appreciate the conversation. I appreciate your time for being here. I miss you all very much. I wish we could make some music like we normally do, but of course, uh, safety first. We'll, we'll get to the music. We'll come back uh, when it's safe to do so. And I, I very much look forward to our first time back together on stage because I know it'll be absolutely magical and special. Um, so um, next week for our viewers, next week we have actually a coffee date. It's at 10.30 in the morning on Tuesday and we're gonna visit with the brass section. Uh, I imagine we're, we'll get a lot of votes for Mahler on that one. Um, they're kind of, that's, that's, the, that's the patron saint of, of brass playing, I think, uh, as far as composers go. But uh, again, th thank, Thank to each and every one of you for, for being here, for joining me tonight. And uh, thank you for the audience. Uh, I appreciate the questions and I look forward to seeing you uh, very soon again. Thanks guys, be safe.